Professor Basado almost needs no introduction to anyone here. He's the director, or former director, of the Max Planck Institute for Comparative and International Private Law in Hamburg, a German legal scholar, and his mind, mind, main field of research focus on private international law, on European private and commercial law, with an emphasis on competition, transport, traffic law, as well as insurance law. He has an exceptional academic career, and you may find his profile at page nine of the profile, uh, program. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Basado to the stage. Honorable dignitaries, excellencies, distinguished colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Anniversaries are days of remembrance of the past, of assessing the challenges of the present, and of contemplating options for the future. My paper is dedicated to these three perspectives. Let me start with the past. The 125th anniversary of the Hague Conference, with its name so uncommon for an international organization, draws our attention to the second half of the 19th century. What was the situation like that gave rise to the first Hague Conference convened by Tobias Asser in 1893? It can be encapsulated in some keywords. First, the rise of the bourgeois society to its climax and highest perfection. The outline would be fine if you could. Put yeah, I can, I can put that. Huh? We have an outline so, uh, <laughs> so that you know how much you will have to uh, wait for the uh, coffee break. Uh, <laughs> So, several points which encapsulate uh, the situation of the second half of the 19th century. First, the rise of the bourgeois society. The second one is the positivistic belief in the ability of mankind to perceive and shape all conditions of life. The third is the assertion of the nation state as the ultimate point of reference of human societies. The fourth is, fourth is the Eurocentric order of the world. And the fifth, what I call the first wave of globalization. The general features of the time have left their traces in the legal landscape at large and in private international law in particular. Thus, positivism and the growing role of the nation state account for the codification movement that had only few followers in the common law world, but prevailed on the European continent and in Latin America. Excluding recourse to any prior law, in particular to Roman law, the codes highlighted the territoriality of and the divergences between national private laws. They became an obstacle when cross-border migration and commerce, triggered by the Industrial Revolution, evolved quickly in the second half of the 19th century. This was perceived in present terminology as a first wave of globalization. The need for conflict rules had previously only existed with regards to scattered local provisions. 
it was now increasingly appreciated as urgent. With a view to continuous legal harmony of decisions and at the initiative of the Italian scholar and politician Mancini, the Institut de Droit International launched the proposal for a uniform private international law to be shaped in international treaties. The first implementation of this proposal occurred in Latin America in the treaties of Lima in 1878 and of Montevideo in 1889. While these conventions were confined to Latin American countries, the Hague Conference convened in 1893 was an exclusively European event. However, over time, the Hague Conventions became influential beyond the shores of Europe. That is due or was due to colonialism. Apart from China, Japan, Thailand, and Ethiopia, the Eastern Hemisphere under European dominance was inclined to consider European achievements as models of societal progress. It was not before 1904 that Japan as the first non-European country attended a Hague Conference. Nevertheless, the conferences essentially remained European events until the end of World War II. In 1951, 15 European countries, including Great Britain, and Japan founded the Hague Conference as an intergovernmental organization. By and by, some countries of the Western Hemisphere, such as the United States in 1964 and Argentina in 1972 joined, but the European countries kept their programmatic influence as evidenced by the ratifications of conventions. The Eurocentric character of the Hague Conference was finally challenged when the European Union took over from its member states the legislative competence for private international law in the Treaty of Amsterdam of 1997. Thereby, the Hague Conference lost its main geographical field of action. But it has made great efforts to keep track of globalization and to attract new members from other continents. This has been very successful. Since the year 2000, more than 30 states from outside the European Union have acceded to the Hague Conference, most of them from non-European countries, the most recent accessions being those of Saudi Arabia and Kazakhstan. The transition of the Hague Conference from a Eurocentric to a universal organization is mirrored, facilitated, and promoted by changes that emerge from a comparison of the old conventions adopted before World War I with the conventions concluded after World War II. The old conventions, just like the Latin American counterparts, were exclusively intended for reciprocal application between states represented at the respective conference. They created a special regime for interstate relations within a closed club. No other states were admitted until special protocols adopted in the 1920s allowed for their adhesion. The post-World War II conventions generally enabled states not represented during the negotiations to accept the binding character of the resulting convention by accession, adhesion, or approval. Now, the Hague conventions are basically open. And many of the new members have, in fact, made use of this possibility to join, thereby gaining positive experience with Hague instruments. A second change is the abandonment of reciprocity with regards to choice of law. The modern conventions are what we call loi uniforme, that apply regardless of whether the designated law is the law of a contracting state. Thus, contracting states need not care for national choice of law provisions in the respective field. By giving effect to the convention, they introduce a national regime which at the same time ensures conformity with international standards. I turn to cooperation 
mechanisms. Hmm. No? That's good. Yeah. At the cro as the cross-border movements of persons, goods, and capital are intensifying, the need for effective judicial cooperation between states increases. It includes all issues of procedural practice, from the service and legalization of documents, across legal aid, the security for legal costs, the procurement of evidence, issues of translation and assessment of foreign law, to jurisdiction and the recognition and enforcement of foreign decisions. Many of these subjects have been dealt with by Hague Conventions. They have received a large number of ratifications and accessions, indicating the demand of the international community. About 100 in the case of adoption cooperation and child abduction, even more in the case of legalization of public documents. Other instruments on civil procedure, on the service abroad of documents, and on the taking of evidence in foreign countries have attracted between 50 and 75 states and still demonstrate their strong interest in judicial cooperation. The explanation for this success is simple. The judiciary in any country cannot avoid the problems that arise where a statement of claim has to be served in a foreign country, where evidence is located abroad, etc. These problems require communication in foreign languages and unknown formalities and are often perceived as troublesome by the judges and government officials involved. They know that the solution depends on the foreign court's cooperation. There is an inherent element of reciprocity. If you help me, I promise to help you. And if you decline to help me, you cannot expect me to provide assistance to you in a similar case. A convention somehow channels the activities needed and formalizes the promise of reciprocity. It can be predicted that instruments on judicial cooperation will attract the approval of states also in the future to the extent that they target complex problems which the courts of one country are unable to escape and to resolve on their own. <clears throat> the recognition and enforcement of foreign judgments appears to be the ultimate and most far-reaching form of judicial cooperation between states, although enforcement applications at present are no longer lodged by the foreign court or state, but by the winning party. Nevertheless, the element of reciprocity still surfaces in some states, such as China, Germany, or Japan, in explicit provisions, requiring the ascertainment of reciprocity as a condition of enforcement. A multilateral treaty might therefore appear to be a welcome solution. Yet, among the Hague Conventions, in this field, the only ones that can be considered as successful are those dealing with very specific areas of family law, such as inter-country adoption, parental responsibility, or to a lesser extent, maintenance awards and divorce decrees. But to date, no instrument of general application to civil and commercial matters has had much effect. The 1971 Hague Convention did not succeed to overcome the traditional bilateral treaty making in this area. Thus, in the field of commercial law, there is a surprising contrast between the great success of the Brussels and Lugano Conventions in Europe and the absence of a workable multilateral regime for the rest of the world. What are the reasons? Is the enforcement of foreign arbitral awards under the New York Convention sufficient for the needs of international commerce? If not, will the Hague Judgments Project fill the gap? First, the significance of claims enforcement for international trade is usually underestimated. 
Trade treaties such as the GATT or preferential trade agreements are state-centered. They regular, regulate quota of importation and exportation, tariff rates, non-tariff regulatory barriers to trade, etc. That is the behavior of governments involved. They do not take account of the fact that within the margin created by these trade treaties, the major part of cross-border trade is in the hands of private undertakings and not of public entities. The trust of private actors, especially smaller ones, inter alia depends on the availability of claims enforcement. However, the people negotiating the Hague Judgments Convention have little contact with the officers of their own governments who are responsible for international trade. The representative of both sides appear to act like strangers in the night. This has always been the case with the single exception of the Rome EEC Treaty of 1957. The objective of the common market included the customs union as well as the removal of quotas and regulatory barriers. In this respect, the EEC Treaty was a trade agreement. In the last phase of negotiations, the delegations became aware that for the implementation of the common market, the confidence of the private market participants in claims enforcement plays an important role. They added Article 220, which, among others, tasked the member states to negotiate a convention on the mutual recognition of judgments. This is the historical origin of the successful Brussels Convention and of the present Brussels Regulation. The lessons that can be learned is that cross-border trade and the enforcement of foreign claims are interrelated. Therefore, states should promote the mutual recognition of judgments in the interest of the increase of cross-border exchanges. Commercial arbitration and the enforcement of foreign arbitral awards is not enough. Since arbitration is not available for many disputes, in particular the ones turning on non-contractual claims and those with low values. Second, states as compared with other areas of judicial assistance are less incentivized to engage in multilateral recognition treaties. Here the situation of courts and governments differs. The enforcement of a foreign judgment is in the hands not of public applicants, but as I said, of private parties. Neither the court addressed nor the government and the state of enforcement are involved in the enforcement of their own judicial decisions in the country of origin of the foreign judgment. Thus, the judiciary does not dwell in the intricate situation that I have described above in the context of other forms of mutual assistance. The consequences of non-enforcement are borne by private parties, not by states, and not by the judiciary. It follows that their incentive to conclude and give effect to an international enforcement treaty is not the same as in other fields of judicial cooperation. Third, the administration of justice does not have the same quality in all countries. There is no point in pretending. In certain countries, judges lack independence or income or both. As a consequence, they are amenable to bribery and their decisions are biased. States with a high esteem of the rule of law will not want to give effect to judgments coming from those countries. As a matter of diplomatic politeness, their governments do not address this issue at the stage of negotiations. Thus, the draft Hague Convention at present does not hint at this problem, contrary, for example, to the Uniform Foreign Country Money Judgments Recognition Act 
of 2005 in the United States. This act clearly rules out the recognition of a foreign judgment, quote, rendered under a judicial system that does not provide impartial tribunals or procedures compatible with the requirements of due process of law, unquote. The preoccupation emerging from these words is not alien to governments in other countries. It is not voiced in public, but it will be decisive in the internal discussions at the stage of ratification unless the convention provides for some safety valve. In a recognition treaty that is open for worldwide accession, the contracting parties should be permitted to avoid for themselves the effects of a future accession to its, by its non-acceptance, similar to what has been agreed upon in the Child Abduction Convention. This is, however, not enough. Contracting states should, moreover, be allowed to exclude the application of the instrument in the relationship with specific contracting states. This is a very delicate issue since states are usually reluctant to make any kind of negative statement about other states. More compatible with diplomatic habits might be allowing states declarations that they would apply the convention only in relation to contracting states contained in a positive list, thereby implicitly excluding the recognition of decisions from other jurisdictions. Such declarations should be limited in time, requiring a review and eventually a renewal when that time has elapsed. Without such a safety valve, the Hague Judgments Convention is unlikely to attract a large number of ratifications. I skip my following section on jurisdiction. I simply would like to, to point out that, in my view, it is possible to agree on jurisdiction with regard to specific subjects, such as parental responsibility or choice of court. But it, for various reasons, it will be very difficult to agree on a, a general convention regulating jurisdiction. I have uh, in my paper some proposals for future cooperation projects, which I would like to summarize here. <clears throat> Most important, especially in connection with the judgment project, would be a kind of post-convention service. Judges have to meet each other, judges from different countries, uh, in order to reduce the uh, sus suspicion that the other side uh, is perhaps less uh, qualified or less willing to cooperate. As for the legislative projects, I would like to recall that ever since the 1980s, there has been incredible, an incredible rise in foreign direct investment. This means, in the terminology of private law, companies, and in times of crisis, insolvencies. These two areas should be targeted by the Hague uh, Conference. I do not believe that um, in company law it will be very easy to get to a, an agreement, but one should try. With regard to insolvencies, of course, one would have to consider the cooperation with UNCITRAL since there is this model law on cross-border insolvencies. Similar is the situation with regard to arbitration. In arbitration, we have quite a number of issues which are not regulated by the UNCITRAL model law and neither by the uh, New York Convention. Uh, this, again, would be something for the Hague Conference in cooperation with UNCITRAL. An area which so far has not been 
targeted by any international organization are the uh, cross-border aspects of class action, of collective redress. So far, it was mainly the United States where this type of action existed. But more and more, we find uh, laws of this kind in some European countries, uh, such as the United Kingdom and Belgium. And the European Commission has now proposed uh, something on class action. So that might be good to uh, tackle the, uh, the international aspects of that. The, as far as small claims are concerned, a similar subject would be uh, the international aspects of alternative dispute resolution. Let me turn to choice of law. In the history of private international law, the predominant issue in academic writings was the choice of the law governing a legal transaction. A look at the status tables of the various Hague Conventions shows, however, the choice, of rule, uh, the choice rules are not appreciated outside Europe. For this purpose, the numerous package conventions that contain both cooperation rules and choice rules um, should be distinguished from the pure choice of law instruments. Among the latter conventions, only the one dealing with the form of wills has received noteworthy approval in non-European countries. 14 out of 42 contracting states are located outside Europe. But the number of non-European parties to other pure choice of law instruments, such as the one on traffic accidents, on products liability, or on maintenance obligations, is next to nil. The finding certainly gives evidence of an underassessment of the role that unified choice rules play for legal certainty, that is, for the predictability of the outcome of disputes and for the planning of legal relations. Nevertheless, it is also a warning to the Hague Conference. Wherever possible, the Conference should frame its future instruments as package conventions, including both cooperation rules and choice rules. This may attract approval from non-European countries, which is urgently needed, since exclusively European conventions will be superseded by EU regulations and are therefore redundant. An alternative might be the adoption of non-binding principles or model laws that signal a certain regulatory need and at the same time provide an internationally approved blueprint while leaving some leeway to national legislation. Again, I shall skip or summarize my ideas about future legislative projects. I have already referred to the law of governing corporations. Another area where perhaps some success could be uh, possible is the, right, uh, the law of property rights. I'm not thinking of this in general, but as the uh, Hague Securities Convention has shown, uh, successful uh, texts in this area should, should focus on specific points, specific subjects. For example, the law applicable to cultural objects, the art market is flourishing all over the world, or the retention of title in uh, the cross-border um, sale of goods. What I think is of a far-reaching uh, significance, perhaps over 6,501 weeks, uh, is the law relating to overriding mandatory provisions. Ever since 1978, international instruments have embodied the concept of overriding mandatory provisions that is, rules of a legal system that require application irrespective of the law otherwise governing the legal relation in question. Such provisions usually establish their own scope of application, 
by unilateral scope rules. Analogous provisions of legal orders other than the governing law may be given effect where a close relation with the case at issue can be ascertained, but that is in the discretion of the court. The concept is most clearly spelled out in the Rome I regulation of the EU. The international instruments usually neither identify the provisions in question nor determine their scope of application. Both is left to national law. Thus, the respective provisions of the international instruments are not more than vague reservations, but they endanger the workability of the bilateral conflict rules of the Convention, where the court applies the overriding mandatory provisions of the forum, the uniformity of outcome is usually excluded. The existence of such general reservation is an invitation to national legislatures to declare new mandatory laws as overriding and to determine a wide scope of application. That is what happens more and more. States tend to declare their own policies to be absolute, not only in the domestic context, but also in the international setting. This is usually designated as an extraterritorial application. An early case was the application of antitrust laws under the so-called effects doctrine. More recent examples can be found in capital market law and in data protection. In capital market law, the listing of securities in a domestic market, a stock exchange, and other connections with the forum state are used as a lever for the imposition of information duties on foreign companies. The new general data protection regulation of the European Union inter alia applies to the processing of data in any country of the world by so-called data controllers from non-European countries, provided that the data subjects, as it is said, are in the Union. The US government, on its side, currently puts pressure on Microsoft Corporation and other companies established in the US to get hold of data stored on servers located outside the country, in particular in Ireland. In all three areas, territorial measures of public enforcement go hand in hand with an extension of the scope of application of the relevant laws in private enforcement to extraterritorial fact situation. Since such developments challenge the operation of bilateral conflict rules, they deserve closer attention in the future. The evolution of international competition law is instructive. What used to be an entirely unilateral approach in the beginning does not exclude a later turn to bilateralism when a certain approximation of the substantive laws occurs. In fact, the gradual proliferation of antitrust laws from the US first to Western Europe and gradually across the whole globe nowadays allows for the application of foreign antitrust laws in civil litigation. And both the Swiss Law on Private International Law of 1978 and the Rome II regulation of the EU contain conflict rules that in appropriate situations may designate foreign competition law. What has happened in antitrust law may also be achieved in other areas. What is needed is a precise functional comparison of the substantive laws of the various jurisdictions. Do they really differ that much or do they provide equivalent protection? We further need a check of claims of extraterritorial application in view of what has been called negative comity. Is every policy pursued at home absolute in international relations? A third basic issue concerns the relation between public and private enforcement. Should the extraterritorial extension of the scope of a law for the purposes 
of ex ante public enforcement generally be transferred to private enforcement, for example, um, as it is uh, done in the, uh, in the European uh, Data Protection Regulation. A fourth point resulting from the others could be the basic inclination to give effect to foreign legal rules in the field of at issue which pursue similar objectives. Much research and discussion is required. The Hague Conference could provide a platform for such activities. Now, I, um, I summarize my part on the impact of human rights which is a very European subject. In uh, Europe, individuals have a right of complaint to the European Court of Human Rights. And uh, they, for the last 20 years or so, they have made use of that also in issues, in, in cases uh, involving private international law. So we have quite a lot of case law in this area, uh, which is, however, not to be understood, as I interpret it, as replacing private international law. It is rather giving an impulse to, uh, for a reconsideration of rules on private international law. And I want to give you an example for that, which is uh, surrogate motherhood. Surrogacy is prohibited in some countries, but lawful in others, sometimes subject to certain procedures. In light of the prohibition in their own state, would-be parents from the former countries often enter into surrogacy agreements uh, with women from the latter countries. For example, California or Russia, or as I recently heard, Laos. Huh? When the child has been registered in the country of birth as the child of the intended parents, the couple will usually take the child to their country of residence and lodge an application for the recognition of the foreign birth certificate. Now, is the dismissal of such application based on the prohibition of surrogacy a violation of human rights? The European Court of Human Rights has answered this question in the affirmative with regard to the child's right, uh, respect, right to respect for private life. But there were other cases uh, where the court has given a negative answer. The Hague Conference has started work on this matter. It considers the issue as one of recognition of a personal status acquired abroad in accordance with the law of the foreign country. The case law appears to endorse the principle of recognition perhaps mitigated by some restrictions that is imposed by human rights law. But adjudication ex post is different from legislation ex ante. And when it comes to the convention, uh, to the ratification of a convention, this would be a case of legislation ex ante. A principle of recognition enshrined in a treaty would have difficulty to overcome at the stage of ratification by states the strong political opposition against surrogacy that is existent in many countries and that is motivated by socialist, by feminist, and by religious policy considerations. Viewing the relation between the states as one of supply and demand might yield better results with a view to the future approval of a binding instruments by states from both sides. It would require a regulation that transcends the ex post perspective of recognition. It should establish procedural arrangements following, for example, the Uniform Parentage Act in the United States. That act requires a check of the intended parents with regards to their physical, medical, social aptness, and a check of the gestational mother in respect of her age, her health, her free will, and her ability to give birth to a child. 
Such checks could be carried out on behalf of central authorities in the countries involved. Following the cooperation pattern established by the Intercountry Adoption Convention, the central authorities would communicate with each other and benefit from the other's knowledge. Thus, inspiration could be gained from the American Uniform Parentage Act and the Hague Adoption Convention taken together. The resulting Hague instrument would be a package convention as outlined above. I come to my last part on institutional recommendations. The Hague Conference emerged as an intergovernmental event and later organization at a time when states appeared to be the sole and almighty framers of human societies. International private relations could only be ordered by allocating competence to one of the states involved. The allocation method helped to increase legal certainty in the interest of private actors and to affirm the sovereign powers of states by recognizing their national private law. Is this model still appropriate to explain the current situation? In light of the more recent developments, institutional modifications suggest themselves. In several areas, the allocation method has been supplemented by the unification of substantive law promoted by numerous international organizations, some of them with a sector-specific, other with a general purview. The overall legal framework should, however, be consistent. Substantive law and private international law dealing with the same sector should be adapted to each other. This requires a close cooperation of the organizations involved that has already been put into effect in some cases. The all-embracing sovereignty of states in respect of social ordering has in reality also ceded to a mix of influences exercised by social and economic groups on the one side and public administrations on the other. The Hague Conference might be better off if it establishes for certain projects advisory committees that permit organized group interests to voice their concern at an, as an, at an early stage. This is particularly important where specific subjects are treated which involve groups representing homogeneous interests. This proposal may also help to include the Islamic world into the deliberations relating to personal status, family relations, and succession law. In Europe and the Western world, Secular, secularization has subjected these areas to state law. But one cannot close the eyes that they are under strong, in some countries of the Middle East and Asia, even exclusive influence of religion. Governments from those states are therefore not interested <clears throat> in Hague deliberations on matters of personal status, although Muslims are very, very much involved in cross-border migration as well. The Hague Conference should try to open channels of information and discussion with the Islamic world, also in the field of personal status and family law. The suggested advisory commissions could serve this purpose. Further recommendations relate to the growing number of members of the Hague Conference. Some of the new member states have little experience in private international law and more generally in the administration of a judiciary working under the rule of law. They need advice on the publication of legislation and jurisprudence and their judicial personnel needs training in conflict of laws which is not available in their respective country. The Hague Conference should initiate, perhaps together with other international organizations, capacity building programs which are geared towards the formation of judiciaries that are able to handle the legislative texts approved by their governments. Finally, 
The anniversary draws our attention to the problem of aging conventions. The Hague Conference should consider ways of simplified amendment of its instruments. The need for a ratification of every amendment in practice is conducive to either the disintegration of uniform law that occurs where not all contracting parties of a basic convention ratify an amendment, or to the petrification of outdated rules that results where the contracting parties abstain from an amendment that would appear appropriate in light of changed circumstances. Simplified amendment procedures are, of course, confined to very specific points, but they are needed, and they exist in various forms in other sectors of uniform law. Let me conclude. 125 years ago, the Hague Conference took off as a Eurocentric undertaking of a dozen states with similar legal and cultural traditions. It has been a long way from there to the present worldwide organization with more than 80 member states from very divergent legal and cultural backgrounds. While the conference still faces the same basic problem, that is the coordination of different legal orders, the institutional environment has undergone profound changes. The Hague Conference will have to adjust by the institutional changes outlined above and by focusing on universal instead of European demand. It has to address the universal need for cooperation rules and for what I have designated as package instruments. Its future task is not only the coordination of state behavior, but the service to an international private community that is needed, that is in need of legal certainty in a world that allows for global movements impaired by divergent territorial laws. Thank you very much. Thank you.